Our topic tonight is World Transformer. I'll introduce the topic by telling a story, a fictional story. We're going to imagine a girl or a woman of about 17, who is the oldest of four children. She lives in a loving family. She has a good relationship with her parents. And she feels the world is a bright, happy place with bright prospects for the future. One day her father dies, perhaps in an accident. And for the girl, the world becomes dark and gray and cold. Her mother can't give the girl much attention. She has to, the, the mother has to spend time keeping the family afloat financially and taking care of her younger siblings, the girl's younger siblings. So the girl feels neglected. Life is hard. Let's imagine it's January or February and the weather is hard and cold and dark. The girl has trouble getting out of bed in the morning and going about her business. At night she lies in bed and can't sleep and cries. The world is a harsh place. But one day she meets a man. Now she had had boyfriends in the past, but this man is totally beyond anything she imagined possible. He's perfect. He's wonderful. He thrills her. He, she can't believe her good fortune. And now the world becomes, again, a wonderful place, a bright place, a place full of hope. Now her family, her friends, don't see the man as so ideal. They see some of his faults. But if they mention anything against him, she refuses to hear it. And if they don't stop, she refuses to have anything to do with them. Now sometimes things go wrong that can't be ignored, but she feels that when that happens, it's her fault, it's her sin. The man is perfect. Now, this can't last. Even if they stay together, even if they get married and spend a lifetime together, eventually she'll come to see him as a human being with faults. He might not be a bad person, but no one is perfect. But now, if instead of a man, we imagine a God who is a person, well, first of all, we don't have daily experience with that God. He lives in our imagination. We can imagine him to be perfect all our lives. And the benefits we get, well, this world benefits our comfort, and security. We have someone to pray for us that we can pray to. Someone who will take care of us. Someone who, in the phrase used in Christianity, who will never give us a cross too heavy for us to bear. And that's only this life benefits. We also have the prospect of a next life that's eternal and wonderful and happy. These are true advantages that we get from belief in this God. Now, if we live in a civilization that has many gods, it might be a little harder to believe in our God because we might see other people's gods as false and we might wonder, well, it might create some doubts in our mind. So perhaps in time, one God would become recognized by all of society. There'd be a motive to unify. Then all of society would rec recognize one God as the true God. And of course, anyone who threatened belief in that God would not be treated well by the rest of society because they are threatening security, comfort, hope, hope for an afterlife. And people don't want to live in a dark world without hope. Now, if a religious hierarchy developed around this, around this God-man, that would also have a motive to discourage, doubt. They'd have material motives if the hierarchy was treated well, if they were, had prestige, if they had position and power. But they'd also have spiritual reasons, because if they believed that faith in this God-man, this God who was a person, was necessary for salvation, 
that anyone who spread doubt would be worse than the worst virus or bacteria or plague imaginable. Because a plague or a virus can only take your physical life, your earthly life, but you still have the prospect of eternal joy in heaven. But if someone spreads doubt, that's a mental virus, a religious virus, and that can take an eternity of bliss company of God away from you, or so the religious hierarchy would believe. So they would have motives for suppressing any doubt. And if enough people believed, and the hierarchy was powerful enough, this God might even become the official God of the state. It might be a theocracy. And the state would see the advantage of supporting the hierarchy. If the hierarchy recognized the state, it would be a unifying factor for society and it would be providing people with things they want, comfort, security. In Europe in the Middle Ages, there were states that had official religions. I believe through a series of horrible religious wars that eventually Europe eventually arrived at the idea of religious freedom. But there are states today in the world, countries, where there is an official religion, and if you disagree with it, if you disagree with the state god, you could get into serious trouble. So these are some of the mechanics, I believe, why gods who are persons have been so popular in history, and why they've often been recognized by the state as the sole god, as as the official god of the state or an empire or whatever the case may be. So, thank you for listening.